It is a great pleasure to have here Lawrence Hitchison, which uh, who is a cur currently lecturer Bristol University. So I know him because he was one year ahead of me in completing his PhD at the Gatsby Computational Neurons, Neuroscience Unit. At the time, working in between machine learning neuroscience, focusing on trying to explain what the brain does uh, and um, doing a lot of work around the sampling hypothesis, let's say, where, whereby you assume the brain is doing some sort of computation inference to be specific and that you can explain uh, what it does and some of the variability in neural activity by uh, explaining it as uh, inference and more precisely a sampling type based inference. Uh, since then, he has been postdoc at Cambridge. He has mostly moved his research more towards machine learning. He's interested in Bayesian neural networks, connection to GP when you take limit in width, depth, and all these things. Uh, and um, I think right now he is going to talk to us on really great topic. And uh, since he has an architecture that does uh, deep GP, maybe a better way than what pre exists, and should talk to us about this today. Correct me if I'm wrong, but otherwise, I leave you the microphone. Awesome. Thanks, Vincent. All right. So to get started, um, it's worth thinking a little bit about the relative advantages of neural networks and Gaussian processes. So I'm going to sort of take this at a super high, very gross scale. But at that scale, neural networks are really, really good at sort of uh, image classification tasks. So these really difficult tasks um, that, you know, before about 2012, we really couldn't do a very good job on. And I'm well aware that there are some Gaussian process methods that do some of these like image classification tasks, but I really don't think anyone's gonna argue with me when I say that neural networks are, you know, work better in a bunch of different ways. But at the same time, it turns out that accurate Bayesian uncertainty estimation is really, really, really painful in neural networks. And again, a gross uh, simplification, but I don't think it's that much of a gross simplification to say that all of the methods that exist are gross approximations. You know, there are big problems with everything we can do um, to reason about uncertainty in neural networks. In contrast, if we think about the Gaussian process world, we have closed form posteriors in small cases and reasonably effective inducing point approximate posteriors in higher dimensional cases. Um, so then the question is, well, can we combine the advantages of Gaussian processes and Bayesian neural networks? Can we somehow get um, accurate uncertainty estimation from Gaussian processes and combine that um, with state-of-the-art performance on these difficult tasks like image classification? And so this is going to be sort of the key uh, topic of the talk, and it's the topic of three papers um, that I'm going to take you through in sequence. So the first paper looks at infinite neural networks, so infinitely wide neural networks. And in particular, we're able to show that as you take that limit, then the outputs become Gaussian process distributed. And that's now really nice because in principle, or we can actually do exact inference in these state-of-the-art neural network architectures. So that sounds amazing. And it sounds like you know, the problem might be solved sort of before we've even started. The problem is that the performance of these infinitely wide neural networks, which are also called uh, neural network Gaussian processes or NNGPs, so the performance is really poor, like abjectly bad. Um, and so in this next paper, in this next part of the talk, we're going to have a little think about why that's the case. And it turns out that sort of the key thing that neural networks do is representation learning, learning a good top layer representation of say images in this case. And it's gonna turn out that this doesn't happen in the neural network GP case, and that's gonna cause us a big problem. And so then the deep kernel process is gonna fix this. So it's gonna introduce flexible representation learning. And at the same time, it's gonna have much of the tractability of the underlying Gaussian process. 
And to sort of distinguish it from the deep uh, Gaussian process, the deep Gaussian process asks us to reason about approximate posteriors over the intermediate layer features. Here, we're going to be working entirely with kernels. So we're going to sort of have inputs, have a bunch of kernels through the middle, and then just have some outputs. And this is going to turn out to be really nice, both because the true posteriors might even be unimodal. Um, we're working on this at the moment. Um, and so that, therefore, they should be really easy to work with in, say, a variational approximate posterior. And at the same time, many models that we care about, neural networks, these infinite neural networks, NNGPs, and deep Gaussian processes are all special cases of the deep kernel process framework. So then without further ado, uh, I will get going on the first part of the talk, the new hope. Um, on infinite neural networks as Gaussian processes. And before I get started, I should say that this is work with uh, Carl, who I'm sure you all know, and Adria Gariga Alonso, who is Carl's PhD student um, in the engineering department in Cambridge. Okay, so I'm not gonna go too deeply into this work. I'm gonna almost use it as a, a way of introducing the general topic. And so to that end, I'm going to talk about how neural networks become Gaussian processes in a zero hidden layer network, which is actually the same as Bayesian linear aggression, a one hidden layer network, which is infinite, which was studied by Radford Neal initially, and then infinite deep networks, and finally, um, state-of-the-art convolutional architectures, which are again infinitely wide, um, such as ResNets. And those are the ones that we considered um, in the paper with Carl and Adrian. Okay, so to just warm us up slowly then, we can consider um, sort of the simplest possible architecture where this uh, correspondence holds. And that's where we have a batch of input vectors um, and we have one scalar output for each of these input vectors. And that's given by multiplying the inputs by this weight vector. And that weight vector is Gaussian distributed. And hopefully many of you will have seen that in this situation, we can kind of combine the Gaussian distribution up here to give us a distribution over the Ys. And that distribution looks like this. And this is kind of the Gaussian process viewpoint on Bayesian linear aggression. And sort of intuitively what will be going on here is that the more similar the Xs are in here, then the more correlated um, the corresponding outputs are going to be. Okay, so that's uh, sort of, okay. And then the key thing to remember from this is that for the distribution over outputs here, all we need is the kernel, uh, the kernel formed by this uh, product of the inputs with themselves. We don't need the full input uh, vectors, and that's going to be a thing that turns up again and again and again. So it will be the same for the hidden units as well. Okay, so then on to the one hidden layer network case. So this is slightly more complicated. So we've got a batch of input vectors X, and then we've got an infinite hidden layer, which is given by a nonlinear transform of X's, which have been multiplied by a matrix. And then to get a scalar output, we're going to multiply these hidden um, by another weight vector. And these weight matrix and vector are Gaussian distributed. It's all very nice. Okay, and so then, if I remember the results from the previous slide, if we just take the top part, so just the hiddens, then we can see that the distribution over the outputs has to be Gaussian with a kernel that's determined um, by the product of those hidden with themselves. So this is exactly what we saw in the previous case, but where I've replaced the inputs there with the H's. So then the question is, well, what are these H's in this infinite limit? And so it turns out that in the infinite limit, or in, in, a, in any case really, but certainly in, sorry, I can write this product of the H's as a product over these hidden vectors, where this H lambda is a single unit, and it's gonna be the activation of that hidden unit for every um, input data point. 
So as I take the infinite limit there, there's going to be an infinite um, number of elements in this sum or empirical average. And these are all IID because the input vectors in here to every unit are IID. And so by the law of strong numbers, as I take this limit, this kernel is going to end up equal um, to this expectation. And so critically, this expectation is deterministic. So the kernel, the kernel here, which is going into my Gaussian process, is fixed. It's a fixed function of my inputs. And it's potentially a kind of complicated function of the inputs because there's this nonlinearity involved as well. So to actually compute that, I have to do some integrals with that nonlinearity. But it turns out to be possible in a bunch of cases, oops, sorry, that we care about, including um, say the ReLU kernel. Oh, sorry, ReLU nonlinearity is there's a kernel corresponding to that that we can compute uh, efficiently in closed form. Okay. And so then moving on to a deep network, we extend the same intuition again. So we're going to take the infinite limit of multiple layers. In the feature domain, we're going to start off with some input vectors. Then I'm going to separate things out. So first I'm going to do the matrix, the product with the weight matrix, and then I'm going to take a nonlinear transformation. And then the same at the next layer, I'm going to multiply by the weight matrix, take a nonlinear transformation, and then take this scalar output to be that top layer multiplied by a weight vector. So now I'm going to look at this process in the kernel domain. So in particular, I'm going to start by taking the product of those inputs with themselves. And then it's going to turn out that in the infinite limit, by an argument very similar to the one we saw on the previous slide, that the product of these uh, features f with themselves. I'm going to define that to be the, to be G, a gram matrix. And in this particular case, when I've taken this limit, that's going to be equal to the kernel from the previous layer. And then for the next component, I take this product of the hiddens with themselves. Sorry if I didn't mention this earlier, but all of these matrices are going to be um, training example by training example matrices. So they're going to resemble kernel matrices even though I'm, I'm giving them slightly different names here to distinguish the product of the hiddens from the product of the features. So this kernel matrix here is a nonlinear transformation, which I'm writing as K with no index, of the gram matrix at the previous layer. And so this is a deterministic transformation, which I can compute um, in closed form. And that again depends on the exact form of that nonlinearity. And so then I can do the same thing again at the next layer. So the inner product of the features at the next layer becomes equal to the kernel at the previous layer. And then to get the inner product of these hiddens, I need to nonlinear, nonlinearly transform G, this gram matrix from there. And then at the very top here, so this top layer representation, which is the product of the H's with themselves, becomes equal to our Gaussian process kernel. Okay. And so then, so sort of to take, zoom out again to the big picture, at least in terms of references, um, in the one hidden layer case, that was initially done by Radford Neal. Then in the fully connected case, there were these two papers, this one from Cambridge, which is why I've highlighted, but certainly I'm not on that one. And then in the convolutional case, there were again another couple of papers, one from Cambridge, one from Google Brain. And at this point, there have now been many more on this topic, um, including on various different, even more exciting architectures. But I'm not going to go into depth about exactly how we do the convolutional case here, just because it's a little bit of complicated bookkeeping with the convolutional operations. For our purposes, however, sort of to take a step back, we now have exact inference, because we have the Gaussian process top layer, in state-of-the-art architectures for image classification such as ResNets. And that kind of suggests we're done. We have combined the ResNet architecture and the um, exact inference, potentially. But then, sadly, the neural network empire strikes back when we discover that the performance of the resulting models is kind of terrible. <laughs> 
Um, and so this is a nice figure from actually the other, the Google Brain paper that did the convolutional networks. So they explicitly compared um, different types of neural networks on the bottom here and a sort of reasonably well-tuned buyout network versus this infinite neural network Gaussian process. And we can see that the NNGP down here is performing considerably worse um, than the uh, finite neural network, despite the finite neural network not actually doing anything that's vaguely Bayesian at all. Um, so that raises the question then, why are NNGPs performing so badly? And it should also be said that this is CIFAR 10. So these numbers in general are pretty bad. Um, you should usually be getting up to about 95% on this sort of task. Okay, so in an outline for why this is then, we, the point of these deep neural networks is really to learn this good top layer representation. And we're gonna see that the top layer representation or equivalent the kernel for an infinite neural network is fixed. And that means no representation learning. And that's gonna be a big problem. So we're gonna see in a toy example that this lack of representation learning in large or infinite networks causes problems. It actually sometimes causes, oh, sorry, we're not gonna see that, I've deleted this slide. Um, then we're gonna see theoretical results um, on some deep linear networks on the flexibility that you get in those. And we're gonna see that in real neural networks, um, that flexibility is actually really, really important. So the top layer representations in a train network are very, very different from the corresponding NNGP. And so we would expect you know, performance, there to be big performance differences in those cases. All right. So to remind ourselves again of what happened in this deep infinite network case when we were compute, when we were pushing the kernels through, we started off with the input kernel. And then the product of these pre nonlinearity um, features with themselves is defined to be the gram matrix. And in this case, it's equal to the kernel of the previous layer. And then to get the product of the post nonlinearity um, hidden with themselves, we need a nonlinear transformation that depends on the nonlinearity. And then at the next layer, this repeats. And then finally, that top layer representation becomes equal to the Gaussian process kernel. So the problem is that every step here is deterministic. So this one, and then across for the gram, nonlinear transformation of the gram matrix, and then up here again. And so this uh, Gaussian process kernel is a fixed deterministic function of the inputs. And at the same time here, actually, the top layer representation is a fixed deterministic function of the inputs. So it depends a little bit on the architecture you choose, but it, you can't learn the architecture. So that definitely doesn't help you. And that means there's no representation learning. And of course, the point of neural networks is representation learning. And so that's going to cause us all our problems. So to understand a little bit about how this representation learning emerges, we can start to consider linear networks. And the simplest example is a one layer hidden network. So again, we're gonna have a batch of input vectors. In this, we're just gonna multiply those by a weight matrix and then multiply them again by a weight vector to get our outputs. Um, and then we have the kernel at this layer, which is the product of the H's with themselves. And the output, is now Gaussian process distributed with kernel, which is given by this thing. So now if I combine these three together, if I substitute H into K and K into this thing, then I end up up here. And this makes it evident that these W's in here, these weights, are kernel hyperparameters, because they're, you know, they're parameters that are affecting this kernel. The problem is, that as I take the infinite limit, as I take the limit of infinitely many hidden units, then actually this flexibility embodied in the weights disappears. And that's because I can view this matrix product as sort of an empirical uh, covariance of the vectors in W. And as I then take the infinite limit, that empirical covariance becomes exact 
and this thing here converges on the identity matrix. And so then I end up with this thing down here. So then I just end up with a Gaussian process over Y with a fixed kernel with those X's. And you know, there's no flexibility anymore. There's almost nothing I can do. And so we're able to do a lot more um, analysis of the linear case. And when we do that analysis, um, we get a couple of nice results. Um, okay. So in particular, as neural networks get wider, here n is the neural network width, then the flexibility is going to decrease. And so here, flexibility is measured in terms of the variance of that top layer kernel. And this is here for a one layer network in the blue and a 16 layer network in the orange. And as networks get deeper, we also get more flexibility. And this makes sense because there's more um, stochastic weight matrices along the way. So we expect there to be more randomness building up um, in deeper and deeper networks. And now this green line is for a network of width 64 and the red line is for a network of width uh, about 1,000. Okay, so that's sort of the prior viewpoint, but we can also, in terms of uh, these variances here were for the prior over the top layer kernel, but we can also look at learning the representations in these deep finite networks. So this is now my deep finite network, uh, deep linear, sorry, finite network, where we're just taking uh, the activations of the previous layer and multiplying them by a weight matrix. And so the solution here is gonna rely on two kernels. So it's the input kernel that we've seen before, and also a new concept, which is the output kernel. So this is the product. So it's again, it's a training example by training example matrix, which is the product of the targets with themselves. So for instance, in the case that we're doing um, classification on CFAR 10, let's say, we're gonna, these Ys are gonna be 10 dimensional one hot uh, matrices. And so this overall kernel is gonna be um, rank 10 at the top. Okay. And so then in the middle, we're going to get um, kernels that look something like this. And the intuition here is that we're interpolating from K naught down here up to K three. And so in the middle here, sort of if you imagine expanding this out, we have K three to the power one third and K naught to the power two thirds. And this line is almost like we've got K3 to the power two thirds and K naught here um, to the power one third. And it's also worth pointing out that while these things don't look like um, they're symmetric, this K2 and K1, they actually are. You can just go into NumPy and um, evaluate them. And that's because of the complicated properties of these matrix powers. But, so the key takeaway from our perspective is that this top layer representation, especially in deeper networks, is going to be very, very close to this output kernel. And it's potentially very, very different from the kernel for an infinite network, which would just be k naught down here. So that's how the flexibility um, expresses itself in the linear case. We'd also expect it to emerge um, sort of roughly at least in the nonlinear case. Okay, so then let's think about, so then the question becomes, well, is the infinite limit or this deep linear theory a better description of what happens in a real neural network? So to understand that, we can start by um, computing the correlation between the elements of a kernel. And this is for the infinite kernel, um, compared against a trained neural network, or compared against, sorry, an untrained and trained neural networks down here. And what we see is that for an untrained, randomly initialized finite network, that it's actually pretty close to the infinite network. And this is essentially what we'd expect. But then as soon as we do any training, this correlation, and we're really interested in the, uh, the correlation at the output, which is this third ResNet block, 
um, the correlation of the output drops to almost zero. And so that means the train network is doing something very, very different from what the infinite network is doing. At the same time, we can compute the correlation um, with the output kernel. So in, this is uh, training on CIFAR 10. So this output kernel is this rank 10 matrix formed by taking the product of the one hot targets with themselves. And again, we can see that in the untrained case, there's essentially no correlation um, between the top layer kernel and the output kernel, potentially as we'd expect. But then as soon as we do some training, there's a much bigger correlation. And now this is a slightly odd comparison because really correlation coefficients are not the right way to compare kernel matrices. A much better approach is to look at the eigenspectrums. So that's what we did next. So if you look at the eigenspectrum of the kernel at different layers through your infinite network, you get this beautiful um, power law structure. And it's a roughly similar power law at every layer. And this dark red is the top layer, so that's the one we really care about. But for a train network, we get something dramatically, dramatically different. So I'm not gonna focus in on the earlier layers, even though I think these are some really interesting patterns. The one we really care about is the top layer, and that's in the dark red. And you can see that in the dark red, we have roughly 10 big eigenvalues, and then everything else is close to zero. And that's now very, very similar to the eigenstructure of the output kernel, that product of the targets with themselves. And that is in fact exactly 10 big eigenvectors and everything else being zero. And so then this dark red line is much more similar to what the deep linear theory would suggest in the green than what the infinite neural network theory would suggest in the dark red. And so this really, really is telling us that we need flexibility in our top layer representations and that the neural network Gaussian process or these infinite networks are not enough to get the good performance. Okay, so as a set of intermediate conclusions then, um, we've seen that finite networks perform better than infinite neural network, infinite networks such as these NMGPs. And hopefully I've convinced you that that's because neural networks do representation learning while NMGPs don't. And so that means that to really get the benefits of combining, of combining Gaussian processes and neural networks, we're going to need some highly flexible representation or equivalently kernel learning. And that then is the final part of the talk. That then is the key motivation behind deep kernel processes. Okay. So to give you a quick overview of what we're going to see with deep kernel processes, so I'm gonna start um, by defining deep kernel processes by introducing flexibility into that NNGP de uh, definition that we saw in the previous section. Then I'm gonna show you how deep kernel process priors are equivalent to deep, deep Gaussian process priors. Then I'm gonna argue that posterior inference is much easier with deep kernel processes. Um, I'm gonna show you, just give you a little flavor of a scalable doubly stochastic inducing point scheme that actually works purely in the kernel domain. It doesn't work with features at all. Um, and I'm going to show you a few results on UCI data sets. All right. So this was the uh, NNGP definition that we saw previously. And potentially you're getting a little bit bored of this, um, but you know, repetition is always good. So there's the kernel at the input layer, and then the gram matrix, which is defined to be this product of the features, is in the infinite case, just the kernel from the previous step. And then this product of the hiddens with themselves is defined to be K the kernel, and that's a nonlinear transformation of the gram matrix. And then you can propagate this all the way up. So when we move to the deep kernel process world, we're actually gonna dispense with this interpretation as features. So I'm just gonna get rid of them. And now I have a bit more flexibility with what to do with these gram matrices. So instead of deterministically setting them to the kernel 
from the previous step. I'm now gonna sample them from a distribution, uh, this calligraphic K, over positive de uh, definite matrices, which is somehow centered on that cone from the previous layer. And to make this notion of sort of centering concrete, we're usually gonna choose uh, distributions over matrices such that the expected gram matrix is gonna be equal to the K from the previous layer. And so that sort of intuitively is gonna mean that this uh, calligraphic K distribution is kind of introducing noise around the NNGP that we had previously. Because the in in the NNGP, this was deterministically equal to K. Now we've introduced variability, but still the gram matrix, the expected gram matrix uh, remains equal to K. Okay. And so to understand kind of graphically what's going on, we can plot the kernel and the gram matrices for an actual um, run of this generative process. So we take some X's which have a kernel, which looks like this for the purposes of simplicity. And then we're gonna sample the gram matrix from a distribution. Um, in this case, it's a Vichart distribution, which has expectation K naught. And so we get a sample. You can see that it's got the diagonal as the main thing, but there's variability around it now. And then we're gonna compute a nonlinear transformation of this gram matrix to give the kernel at the next layer. And in this case, this kernel corresponds to, a, or this nonlinear transformation corresponds to a squared exponential kernel. And because the squared exponential kernel has to be positive here, um, all of these elements in the blue are positive. And then when we take the new gram matrix, we again sample, we add some variability. And then for the kernel again, we take a nonlinear transformation. So this was for a Vichart distribution um, for the sampling. We can do the same thing for other distributions over matrices. And the one we really care about is the inverse Vichart. And you can see that intuitively, something very similar is going on, apart from the structure of this noise in here might be slightly different. Okay. So next, we can have a think about when deep uh, kernel processes become, or deep kernel process priors, become equivalent to deep Gaussian processes. So if you remember, this was our definition of my deep kernel process. Um, what I'm going to do now is to set, is to take that uh, distribution over gram matrices, and I'm going to take it to be Vichart. And once I do that, I actually get a new uh, feature domain interpretation. So in particular, if we start by taking the kernel to be this product of the X's with themselves, then we can take the features at this layer to be Gaussian with kernel given by this thing. And then sort of following the usual deep Gaussian process formulation, we take the kernel for the next layer to be some uh, function here of the features, so this might be a squared exponential kernel. And it's going to turn out, which we're going to see in future slides, that this can be written in terms of the gram matrix. So that's kind of critical. And then we do the same thing again at the next layer. We sample some features from a Gaussian with this kernel, and then we compute the kernel at the next layer based um, on those features. And then we take this uh, top layer representation here to be the Gaussian process kernel. And so there's really two tricks that I've done here, which we're going to look at on future slides. So the first is that if this F here is Gaussian, then the G is Vichart. So this Gaussian distribution over here corresponds um, to the Vichart distribution over gram matrices here. And then the second key part is that the kernel in many cases that we care about, can be equivalently written um, as a function of the features, F1, or as a function here of the gram matrix. Okay, so I'm now gonna go into those two tricks in a little bit more depth. <laughs> 
So the first one, the grand matrices are Vishart distributed. So in fact, the very definition of this Vishart distribution over positive definite matrices is that I take a bunch of matrices, a bunch of vectors, sorry, F lambda, sampled uh, from a distribution here with zero mean and covariance K, and then I stack them all together into a big matrix. And then the Vishart is defined to be the product of F, F transpose, which we know has to be this positive semi-definite matrix. Okay, and so the only difference between this setup and what I actually had on the previous slide was a normalization. So it turns out that there's this kind of linearity through this. So if I divide the kernel here by n, then I also divide these samples by n. And this is useful here because the actual value of this FF transposed is going to scale up here with n, which we don't actually want in our case. But this then identification of the Bichard and the Gaussian samples really just comes then from the definition of this Bichard distribution over positive definite matrices. And the second trick um, is this notion that kernels that we care about can often be written in terms of the grand matrix. And so I'm going to particularly focus on isotropic kernels, which are a function only of the distance between points. And so one example of this would be the squared exponential kernel. And so here, the ij element of that kernel would be some function of the features, and in particular, it'd be e to the minus r, where r is going to be the squared distance between features, which is defined as this thing. OK. But it turns out that this squared distance can be obtained from the grand matrix. And there's a little bit of algebra, um, but certainly I know that the kernel, as opposed to necessarily Gaussian process community, um, use this relationship a whole lot. And so then the squared distance can be written as this thing down here. And then as soon as I have the squared distance in terms of the grand matrix, I can use that in this kernel up here. And so I can equivalently write the kernel, which previously was a function of the features, as now k, which is a function of the grand matrix, which is now this thing down here. All right. So that's great. Um, that's shown us that the deep Gaussian process prior is equivalent in some cases to the deep kernel process prior. But then the question becomes, well, why don't I just work with deep Gaussian processes? Like there's loads of existing tools that I can use to work with them. Why bother doing this whole exercise? And the answer is that posterior inference with deep kernel processes works much, much better. And the reason is that deep Gaussian process true posteriors have infinitely many modes, um, which arise from rotation symmetries. So it turns out that I can actually rotate intermediate layer feature vectors and get exactly the same posterior probability. So this is hard to show graphically, so I'm not actually going to show the deep Gaussian process case, but it's in the paper if you're interested. Instead, I'm going to look at the Bayesian neural network case. So Bayesian neural network have complex multimodal posteriors. Um, they're probably not actually infinitely many modes, so there probably is a discrete number of nodes, and we can look at some of them. And these arise from permutation symmetries. So it actually turns out that permutation symmetries are a subset of rotation symmetries. So these two things are really very closely related. OK. But in contrast, deep kernel process posteriors are much simpler and easier to approximate. And that's because there's no permutation or rotation symmetries at all. Um, and they may even be have unimodal true posteriors. So this is some work that we've got in progress. But if that were the case, then it would be very easy to um, accurately approximate those unimodal true posteriors with unimodal variational approximate posteriors. Whereas, you know, trying to um, give, a, give a variational approximate posterior for something with infinitely many modes or complicated multimodal structure is definitely going to be hard. All right. So 
shouldn't need reiterating, but this is a nice image of a Bayesian neural network lost landscape in terms of the weights. It's completely nightmarish. I hope no one would try and approximate this uh, using a standard uh, variational approximate posterior, which typically would assume only one mode. So where does that complexity come from? Well, I would argue that at least some of it comes from a permutation symmetries. So what I mean by that is I'm gonna swap the identities of these two intermediate layer neurons. And at the same time, I'm gonna swap all of the incoming and outgoing weights. So we can go backwards again. So now critically, the input output transformation for this and this are exactly the same. But if I look at the weight matrices up here, so here I'm using the blue things to represent a positive elements, the red ones to represent negative elements, oops, sorry, then the weight matrices are different. So we have two networks with exactly the same input output transformation with different weight matrices. So that is the definition of one of these symmetries. And that means that we have to have symmetries in the true posterior. Sort of the true posterior probability of this network has to be the same as the true posterior probability of this network. And I can't capture those symmetries um, using standard approximate posteriors. And as I say, there's similar issues with deep Gaussian processes. It's just harder to represent that rotation. Okay. Now, in contrast, Deep kernel processes have much simpler posteriors because they don't have these symmetries. So it, the symmetries that I showed you were permutation symmetries in the case of a Bayesian neural network and rotation symmetries in the case of a deep Gaussian process. Um, but they're all subsets of unitary transformations, i.e. Um, ones for which you, you transpose here is the identity. So if I imagine transforming now my features by this unitary transformation, then it actually probably leaves the ground matrix unchanged. So in particular, if we take G prime to be this uh, ground matrix for the transformed features, by definition, that's this thing, F prime times F prime transposed. If I substitute in my definition of F prime, I get this. And then the UU transpose here cancel out because of this identity for the unitary transformations. And I just get back to the original ground matrix. So this huge source of multimodality for Bayesian neural networks and deep Gaussian processes just disappears if I work with the ground matrices rather than the underlying features. And actually, this is even stronger. So we have strong reason to suspect and are currently working on it that deep kernel processes are provably unimodal in the linear case. And we believe that sort of practically speaking, they're gonna be unimodal in non-linear cases as well. So that's you know, potentially really cool from a statistical perspective because it means we're actually gonna get identifiable multi-layer models. And at the same time, this should be much, much easier to approximate using variational inference. Okay, so then, we actually need to use these things practically. So we developed a variational inference procedure, and this case for deep inverse Vichart processes. So it turns out deep Vichart processes are harder. If you want to ask me about this in the questions, please do. Um, but Sebastian Aubert, who again is one of Carl's students, so you may or may not uh, have seen him around, uh, Sebastian is working on them and we seem to be making good progress. But the idea here sort of very quickly is that we have a generative model, and this is just writing out the generative model um, that we saw on previous slides for the inverse Bichart case. And so we've got this sampling from the inverse Bichart, and we have these nonlinear transformations K in there as well. And in the simplest case, we can just have a factorized approximate posterior taking something like this form down here. So it's again inverse Bichart with some covariance and some degrees of freedom parametering here. And I don't want to go into these in too much depth. Um, and this doesn't give us the scalable um, inducing point inference case. That's kind of hard to write down. You can look in the paper if you're interested in the details. 
One very nice thing that happens here in the inverse Bichard case is that there's this real value delta parameter in the prior. And actually, as this delta goes to infinity, this inverse Bichard becomes deterministic. So the variance goes to zero, and then we actually get back a neural network Gaussian process. And so now this is really cool because the neural network Gaussian process is sort of strictly a subset of this model. And so we'd expect this model sort of has to, in some sense, perform better than the NNGP. Okay. And so, as I mentioned, we developed this scalable stochastic, uh, doubly stochastic inducing point inference scheme. And I'm not going to go through it, but it is worth noting the complexity. So if you uh, take the usual definitions of n being the number of training points, m being the number of inducing points, and d uh, being the number of deep Gaussian process features, then <clears throat> for deep Gaussian processes, the complexity is either this or it's this. And the difference is in whether I learn a different covariance matrix for each feature um, on this side, which should give me slightly better performance, or whether I force all those covariance matrices to be the same, which is going to give me slightly worse approximations, but considerably better um, computational costs. In contrast to the inverse Bichard process, or the deep inverse Bichard process, um, I just have this computational cost. And because I never actually, the, the features don't exist anymore, there's no way I can actually introduce a scaling by the number of features in here. And so I get this nice computational cost without this penalty of forcing the features to have the same covariance. Okay, so in conclusion, the other point there is that deep kernel processes are very practical. So anywhere where you can use a deep Gaussian process, you can use a deep kernel process. And so finally, um, I would like to show some results on a UCI data set. So here, there's kind of two comparison points. So this is the deep inverse Fischer process. This is our model. Um, this is a neural network Gaussian process. So as I mentioned, this is a sort of strict subset of this model in here. And so actually, we always expect the deep inverse Bichard process to perform better. Um, very occasionally, the NNGP performs better, and I suspect that's due to optimization issues. And also very occasionally, they're statistically indistinguishable. And then all the way down here, we have the deep Gaussian process. So this is considerably worse, and I don't know how well um, any of you know this literature, but potentially you could argue I've been a little bit unfair in the sense that normally with deep Gaussian processes, you do a lot of architectural tricks to make the learning work well. Can you also say how many layers you're using in these models? I believe it's either two or three. I actually forget off the top of my head. I, yeah. Um, so these architectural tricks involve having a sort of residual-like structure where you put the input directly into the output and you add that to the, the rest of the flow. So here, what I've done is to just do a standard feed forward uh, connection pattern, absolutely no residual structure, nothing complicated. And, oops, sorry, one of the other interesting things about this approach is that it is much, much more robust to these different architectural patterns. And that's really because if you zoom out to kind of 10,000 feet, all I've done is Gaussian process regression, where I've added a bit of noise to the kernel as it goes through. And you can see that adding a bit of noise to the kernel and then doing GP regression, there shouldn't be any big issues with propagating uh, gradients through that process. Okay. And so then in conclusion, so these deep kernel processes have flexible learned representations as in these finite neural networks, but at the same time, they've got simple potentially unimodal approximate posteriors at all layers, which makes them potentially very easy to approximate with variation inputs. So deep kernel processes include as a subset um, lots of generative models that we care about. And in this particular instantiation, we developed a scalable doubly stochastic inducing point variational inference scheme for 
deep inverse Bichat processes, which turn out to give us really good performance on these toy tasks. And so then my sort of where we're taking this, the future work here, is to start by thinking about a bunch of application domains. So essentially, anywhere you use a deep Gaussian process, you can swap in a deep inverse Bichat process or a deep kernel process, and it should work as well, if not better. So we're also thinking about reinforcement learning domains. It turns out here people tend to use quite smallish networks. So that seems to be a, a nice application domain for using Bayesian inference in these sort of models would be useful. And also in variational continuum learning, um, where people sort of can do things that are vaguely inspired by Bayes, but it turns out you need to break Bayes and introduce lots of horrible hyperparameters to get it to work properly. And then, as I said, Seb was working on deep Vishar processes. And this is very interesting because it's, it gives you this much more exact link back to deep Gaussian processes. And at the same time, it might allow us to develop efficient random feature approximations, which might then allow us to take these into the convolutional network setting. And finally, this is a really slightly odd area, but stochastic gradient descent and sort of relatives tend to be quite slow. And because we now have this relatively simple um, probabilistic uh, model um, in that forward pass, it's now becoming a little bit possible to replace SGD in these models with something a bit better. So potentially a natural gradient method or an expectation propagation type method. All right, and then finally, there is an implementation here on GitHub. Um, feel free to use it and send me issues. And that implementation is forming the basis of certainly all our future work. So I'm hoping to keep it um, very well updated and nicely working in the future. Great, thanks. Please, any questions? Uh, thank you very much, Lawrence. Uh, I'm gonna see be the moderator ICT lifting our hand. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so my, my first question was just uh, like you at the start of the talk, you mentioned two examples each from I clear 18 and 19, where it seems like basically there's like two papers about the same topic. And uh, could you just comment a little bit on what's different about them or how mm -hmm. they relate to each other? Oh, I mean, the contribution is basically the same. Um, so this paper up here, so this paper, these two papers introduced the notion that uh, deep, infinite, fully connected networks were Gaussian processes. If you talk to them, the authors, um, these ones would argue that they did more thorough um, empirical experiments. These ones would argue that they did more thorough proofs. Um, I think they would both be right, but you know, uh, certainly in terms of, I don't think it would be very easy to publish these one after the other, put it that way. They kind of needed to be parallel. And likewise, something pretty similar happened in here as well. Um, so these are essentially on the same thing, which is the deep, infinitely wide convolutional networks, a Gaussian process distributed, and I think, again, we would argue that we did a slightly different set of experiments. So we did ones that were slightly more focused on the Bayesian interpretation. So we included things like calibration. Um, they did experiments that were slightly more focused on the comparisons to finite neural networks, which is potentially a bit galling because, I mean, we had those results as well. We just thought they were a bit embarrassing, so we didn't put them in the paper, but, you know. Um, Thanks. Um, so yeah, was there, how, how, do you know, did they just coincidentally show up at the same time or? Uh, yeah, I think so. So I think certainly in this last one, yeah, there was, there was lots of stuff, but Adria had basically worked all this out and we knew that these guys were working on it at the same time. So um, we pushed to make sure that we were at the same conference. Yes. I think what happens. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, it certainly seems like an idea whose time had come, certainly once these two were out and we knew it was the truth of the fully connected case, it really kind of had to work with a convolutional case. Mm 
Um, any other questions? I don't see. Um, we have Henry Mawson, a big S. Yeah, please go ahead, Henry. Hi there, thanks for your talk, it was really interesting. Um, so I've used some deep GPs on quite small data sets and I found them very hard to fit. And I wonder if that's maybe some of the reasons that you suggested with the invariances and the multimodal posterior, and perhaps that's more of a problem with these small data sets. Do your deep inverse wishout processes have a similar problem or are they okay for small, smaller data sets as well? Uh, they're amazing on small data sets is the short answer and about the same on big data sets. So I think the intuition is that, um, so all of this multimodality hurts you when you have small data, because in the small data limit, it actually matters whether you're approximating these posteriors correctly. Um, and at the same time, I think sort of eventually you can overwhelm, what am I trying to say? Okay, let's look at the results first. So it turns out that in the biggest data set here is protein, which is about 50,000 examples. So we are getting small benefits for the elbow down here, but in terms of predictive performance is basically exactly the same. But on smaller data sets, such as here, Boston, we're getting huge, huge differences uh, between the Gaussian process and the inverse Bischoff process um, and the same thing in the elbow. So the way I tend to think about this is that fitting the features, the intermediate layer features in a deep Gaussian process is hard. And that introduces lots and lots and lots of problems into the optimization. Because you sort of have to get those intermediate layer features to be reasonably stable for the next layer to make any sense and all of this stuff. In contrast, when you've got a deep inverse Bischoff process, in essence, all that's going on is that you start off with a kernel, and then you add a bit of noise to the kernel, and then you do standard GP regression. And intuitively, that has to work well. And there's additional benefits, such as we actually include this deterministic limit. So if the noise on that kernel and the flexibility there isn't helping, we can shrink that to zero, and it just goes away. And you end up doing exactly um, Gaussian process regression. And that's why this comparison against the NNGP here, we sort of have to be doing better because if um, the NNGP were better, the deep inverse Bischoff process could just converge on that. So I think there's several reasons, but certainly the, the upshot is we expect it to be similar in the large data case where you can just overwhelm everything and end up with deterministic everything, nothing matters anymore. Um, but much, much, much better in the small data case where you're encountering all these issues with poor optimization and multimodal posteriors. Uh, okay, I see uh, Fergus and T have a, still have a question. Let's go Fergus first, maybe. Uh, hi, Lawrence, thanks. Um, so yeah, you raised an interesting question of the permutations of the nodes and the uh, non-identifiability leading to multimodal posterior. And I just, but in this context, I wasn't quite clear why it was something of, to be of concern because if we have, uh, maybe I misunderstood, but if we have degenerate modes, then can we not get away with only focusing on one if, we're, if the layers are gonna give us the same posterior? An excellent question. Um, and again, kind of complicated. So, <laughs> You would hope that that was the case. And if that was the case, something like mean field VI, where you use an independent Gaussian uh, approximate posterior over each weight would work well. And it turns out it doesn't. It turns out it is abjectly awful. Like if you train it naively with no tempering, we're talking on a large model, we're talking like 40% on C bar 10. Mm. It's abjectly dreadful. It's not clear to me exactly why that is, um, but certainly that doesn't work. In the deep Gaussian process case, I think it's potentially more instructive. So because of these symmetries, there are families of equivalent solutions. 
But the problem is that if you imagine like, the, but there's a volume term in there that you're not accounting for. So if you imagine sort of one feature vector up here, if that's kind of close to the origin, then when you think about the equivalent set of solutions, that's kind of a small shell. But if I have a big feature vector, then as I, as I think about the equivalent set of features, that's now a big shell. And so there's a difference in volume there, which I'm not taking into account in my unimodal posterior, but does actually exist. And it does actually factor into the true posterior. And it does actually factor into the deep kernel process. So I apologize if that's a bit esoteric. Um, yeah, no. no, it's an interesting problem. There's some, I mean, I've come across something similar when working with the spectral mixture kernel because the components are interchangeable. Um, and there's some tricks you can do, like force them all to be uh, in the same order. So the first one's always the biggest and then decrease. So, um, yeah, I certainly, I, I've thought about things like that where you impose an ordering, but it always just seemed to be a bit of a mess. And yeah, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> It would make the optimization really painful as well, because then if you sort of want to swap elements, it'd be really miserable. Um, yeah. Cool, T, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just curious if you could talk a bit more about the dark sides of your deep kernel processes or the deep inverse measure, like what doesn't work well, like what, where are you struggling with that? and what are the shortcomings? Yeah, so I think from a deep from a deep Gaussian process viewpoint, um, I can't see any disadvantages. He says, um, but I'm not really a deep Gaussian process person, so that may not be. You know, there may still be disadvantages. My main guess is that. Some schemes for getting very, very, very scalable deep Gaussian processes might not work in the deep kernel process case. Um, but I don't have too much insight into that because, again, I'm not actually an expert on deep Gaussian processes. I think the main disadvantages are with respect to neural networks. So in particular, we can't get um, we can't get convolutional networks working yet. And in fact, I think convolutional networks, yeah, are really important for these cases of image classification. And they're highly non-trivial to get into this framework. So we're kind of pushing in that direction by trying to get the deep Vishart process is thing one. Then there's a random feature approximation to the deep Vishart process. And then once we have that random feature approximation, the hope is that we can do something that's approximately equal um, to the Vishart process, but that looks, because of these random features, an awful lot like processing in a standard neural network, sort of in terms of the absolute final computation. So that's going to be an awful lot of work. And the risk with Bayesian neural network methods is always that you kind of do all this work and all this thinking and performance still isn't amazing, um, which certainly is a possibility, sadly. Um, but at least, yeah, that's certainly a possibility. Um, hopefully, though, as a sort of counterbalance to that, the deep kernel process viewpoint should help us address other problems in machine learning. So things like interpretability because let's say the interpretability of a single unit is, it's a silly question to my mind. And once you have the deep kernel process viewpoint that actually allows you to integrate out those individual units and just think about these representations in terms of these sort of training example by training example similarity matrices, I think that's a much more sensible space in which to be thinking about interpretability, uh, for instance. Thank you. I've got two more questions. If anyone else wants to jump in, I can leave them for later. But, uh, if not, so the closed one is just um, when you were talking about the scaling, how does it scale with number of layers? And 
order linear in the number of layers. Yeah, okay, just checking. And the more open questions, like you talked about the inverse versus Wishart versus Wishart aspects. Can you just go through like what what's the difference about that? Like like where does that actually come in? This is an exciting question. Uh, let me see if I can pull up the. So the difference is in terms of the eigenvectors that Wishart and inverse Wishart processes like. Um, so Wishart, so each of them give you eigenvalues. So at least if I take identity as the sort of input matrix here, each of them give you eigenvectors that are sort of uniformly distributed over the ball. So the only difference then is the distribution of the eigenvalues. Wishart's are happy to give you small eigenvalues, but they don't really like giving you very large eigenvalues. This is three, so it's kind of not obvious there, but they certainly like giving you small eigenvalues. Inverse Wishart's are the opposite. So inverse Wishart's, you can see this little gap, don't like giving you small eigenvalues, but they do like giving you large eigenvalues. Um, and Intuitively, I think this comes from the fact that from the generative process for the Bishart, so the fact that we're sampling um, a bunch of vectors from a Gaussian and then taking in a product. So if none of those vectors happen to lie in a particular direction, then the eigenvalue in that direction is going to be super tiny. And then the inverse Bishart is actually the, literally the inverse of a Bishart distributed matrix. And so that means that these super tiny eigenvalues for the Bishart become super large for the inverse Bishart. Mm -hmm. And this has exciting relationships with um, residual connections. So you can actually potentially see a residual structure in like a ResNet as trying to suppress these very low eigenvalues down here. Because of this sort of feed forward identity connection then, you have to essentially cancel out one of those identity connections to get you a zero eigenvector, which is then much more difficult. Is that is that helpful? H half. So, like, why why would you require the Bishard instead of the inverse Bishard to get things like uh, like towards the convolutional um, layers that you? Oh no! Have? Lost everyone. Oh no, we are still there. We can hear. We can still hear you. Okay. We can still see your screen as well. Hello. Yeah. Oh, um, you turn your speaker volume. Yes, I don't know quite what happened there. I blame my cat. Sorry. Uh, I guess T asked if it's an inverse relationship, what's the pros and cons of one or the other in the, if you're not about residual, if it's just about going for, um, in this architecture. Yeah. Like you were saying, you need the non-inverse Vishar to make progress with the convolutional architecture. Why? Uh, so that's, so we need the, we need the Vishar because the Vishal has this connection with the random features. So that we can exploit that Vishal generative process to get a random feature approximation right. to Vishal, which you can't do for the inverse Vishal. And that's, I mean, part of that is because the Vishal samples are low rank potentially, whereas the inverse Vishal are always full rank. But I think more broadly, they're just different priors. So it ultimately is going to depend on your model and what's actually going on with the data. So if there are cases where I actually want to kill off uh, components of the data, then it might well be a good idea to work with the Bishart. If there's a situation where I definitely don't want to kill off anything in the data, but potentially I want to amplify a dramatically some elements, then maybe I should go with the inverse Vishar. But I think ultimately it's going to be an empirical question 
will just come down to how appropriate these priors are for each case of interest. Thank you. Um, just want to add a thing here. We're, we're above time. So uh, if uh, Lawrence, you're happy to stick around, uh, we're yeah. more than happy to carry on with uh, if there are further questions. Uh, the others, feel free to uh, go back to your businesses.